Hello, everybody. I'm Jorge Tamayo, Network Manager at SDS in Switzerland. I now have the pleasure of introducing the SDSN trend session on monitoring health and well-being. This session is being moderated by Trends Director Jessica Spain. For those of you that don't know Trends, Trends is an SDSN thematic research network on data and statistics, which is particularly interested in how to harness the innovations of the data revolution in support of sustainable development. They also do a lot of work on data governance thinking about issues like how to govern all the sources of information at our disposal and ensure governments respect both our rights to information and privacy. In this session, Jess and her panel members will be talking about some of the data challenges emerging during the COVID-19 epidemic. Jess, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jorge, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you also to the previous panelists um, from Afghanistan. That was a really interesting um, session. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I hope technology will um, uh, be on side um, and this will all work seamlessly. But if you have any issues at any time, please feel free to pop your questions or concerns in the chat box on um, the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so as Jorge said, um, I'm Jessica Espy. I'm the director of SDSN Trends, who are facilitating this session. Um, as Jorge said, SDSN Trends is the thematic network of SDSN focused on data and statistics. Um, and we're focused on how to harness the data revolution for the purposes of achieving sustainable development. So how to use all that innovation and all that big data and new data and all those technological um, uh, changes that we're seeing um, and how to use them for the purposes of monitoring and achieving the sustainable development goals. But we're also concerned with how you do it safely, how you respect people's rights to both information and privacy and make sure that it's uh, within an effective governance framework. So in this one hour discussion, we're, uh, we've invited two very esteemed panelists to join us and um, to discuss how we monitor health and well-being, which is, of course, more pressing than ever as we collectively face the COVID epidemic. Um, I believe you should all be able to see Professor Andy Tatum on your screen already. And I hope that um, Ms. Irina Dinku is also going to be able to show us her video. Ah, there we go. Hi, Irina. Thanks. <laughs> Um, great. So first we're joined by Arena. Um, Arena Dinku is a senior program specialist at the Centre of Excellence for CRVS System, housed at the International Development Research Centre in Ottawa, Canada. Although I believe she's joining us from, um, pos I think it might be Amman? Yes. Yes? Okay, great. Um, in this global world we live, everyone is scattered. Um, anyway, in this capacity, um, uh, Arena provides strategic direction to the Centre of Excellence and oversees technical country support. Um, she's got more than 15 years work on civil registration and vital statistics, as well as working on social and behaviour change programmes. And then um, you can also see Professor Andy Tatum. Um, Andy's a Professor of Spatial Demography and Epidemiology at the University of Southampton in the UK, where he also directs World Pop and Flowminder, um, leading a group of more than 50 researchers and data scientists. And he's very interested in population data uh, and their dynamics, how you can map those different types of population data at different resolutions. And he's done lots of very exciting work, which he'll talk to us more about on how you use um, satellite survey, cell phone data, and so on, to map the distribution of vulnerable populations, uh, which I think he's going to talk to us about specifically with regards to monitoring disease. So over the next hour, we're going to hear brief remarks from both Andy and Arena, and then I'm going to exploit my position as chair to ask a few questions myself before we turn to you all. Um, so at any point in the next uh, 55 minutes, if you have a question, please pop it in the question feature on the GoToWebinar control panel. If you look on your little panel, there's a little drag down button that says questions. Click on that and you can enter a question. Alternatively, you can put it in the chat box and my colleague Steph, um, who's also on the line, will be uh, managing and curating those to make sure we get to as many as possible. So the topic of our discussion now is how we monitor health and well-being. 
and I'm not really sure the level of expertise of all of our viewers today. So I'm just going to start with a few basics and leave the expert stuff to Andy and Arena. Um, so the first thing you need is the building block of any health information system is to understand how big your population is. How many people are you trying to serve and look after? And for that, you need population data. Now, that's generally collected from a census. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with censuses and have filled in the paper forms or the online forms in your country at some point in time, um, or at least are, have, you know, are, are aware of what they, they try to do. So it's a count of the population across the whole country done household by household. But complementing that, you might want specific birth data. You might want to know exactly who's being born, when, where, to whose parents, what gender, and so on. And for that, you might need a birth registration system. Then you might also need to know how many people are coming to your facilities. So how many people are coming to your hospital or healthcare centre, what services they need and so on. And that generally comes from health administrative data. So that's the data collected directly at the health at the hospital and reported back to the government. And then finally, you need to know outcome data. How many people are getting well again or tragically, how many people go on to die? And the latter is recorded by hospitals but it's also recorded through your civil registration system again, in which you record the total number of deaths. So these are the really basic building blocks of what you need to monitor health and well-being in any given country. And that's kind of what the basic health monitoring system should look like in practice. But in reality, is this what it looks like all over the world? Well, to see what you all know about this topic, we're going to do a quick poll. Because um, I just want to see how familiar you are with the kind of state of um, healthcare data around the world. So on your screen, on the right hand side, on your control panel, um, you should see um, a poll. In fact, thank you, Steph has just popped it up. Um, so that should be emerging on your screen and it should have a big question that says, how many children under five do not have a birth certificate, i.e. do not officially exist? So I'm going to ask you all to have a go at completing this. How many children around the world do you think are not registered every year? Um, so when they're born, um, they're not recorded at the health facility or their parents do not take them to be registered um, and so on. I'm just going to give you another um, 10 seconds or so for as many people as possible to complete that. So click on what you think is the appropriate answer and then press submit. I'll give you a few more seconds. I hope technology is uh, playing ball and you're all able to see this and complete it. Great, okay, so we're gonna close that poll now. Um, and as you can see from the responses, we have got the majority of people saying one in eight. So um, an eighth of all children around the world do not have a birth certificate and are not being officially recorded when they're born. I'm sorry to say, that the answer that received the least support is the most accurate one. So tragically, around the world, a quarter, one in four, the first option, a quarter of all children around the world are not having their births recorded. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that poses huge challenges for us trying to understand where those children are, how many are being born, um, what gender they are, and so on. So it's a pretty tragic state of affairs that we don't even have this most basic information. We're going to do one more poll just to get you all um, awake um, and then we're going to turn to our speakers. So the next question is around reporting of deaths. So obviously in the context of an epidemic like COVID, us knowing how many people are dying um, is hugely important, tragically. Um, and so we need to know um, countries' death statistics um, and we need to know uh, we need those to be reported as frequently as possible. Now, the way countries do that is they collect that information and then they report it to the UN Statistics Division in the United Nations. So how many countries around the world do you think are reporting the total number of deaths every year? How many countries? Do you think it's 194? So most of the members of the UN General Assembly? Do you think it's about 120? So a good, a good uh, chunk, about two thirds, or do you think it's 88? Um, okay, I'm gonna give you another 10 seconds to do that. Thanks everyone. I'm glad to see fingers on buzzers, even though it's either very early for you or very late or somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Great, all right. And Steph, we're now gonna close that poll. Okay, 
So again, everyone's taking the middle line today, but I'm afraid that that's not correct. As much as we would love to have 120 <coughs> countries reporting um, their death statistics every year, the tragic fact is that it is close, it's less than half. It is 88 countries that report their death statistics to the UN every year that have quality statistics and information on how many people are dying and are recording that. That is 88 out of 193 member states within the UN General Assembly, but of course more than 200 countries worldwide. So again, a pretty abysmal state of affairs that really that's the total number of countries that are able to report um, their death data every year. So now you've got a good sense, the quality of our civil registration systems around the world and much of our other health and wellbeing data is pretty dire. So in that context, how do we monitor the COVID-19 crisis? So I'm gonna hand over to two far more expert colleagues than me to tell us a bit more. So Arena, starting with you, do these statistics say it all? Um, do we really not know how many people are being born and how many people are dying around the world? Can you tell us a little bit more? Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, it's hard to come after a compelling speaker already. The truth of the matter is that we don't really know how many births are happening around the world, how many people have a legal identity, and, and sadly, we do not know how many deaths are, are happening around the world, what are the causes, um, and uh, uh, disaggregation is even more, more difficult. But I'm going to ask Steph to put my very short presentation on, maybe to help those online, if possible. If not, and while she's doing that, you were talking about CV registration and vital statistic systems, but what are these CV registration and vital statistic systems for the people who are listening to us on, online? Now, these civil registration systems are the book of life. They are actually the, the, they record the vital events, the births, the marriages, the adoptions, the recognitions, and the deaths with its causes. And out of which we can pull out vital statistics who are an important tool for good governance, and they can provide in the instances where the coverage is good, important statistics about uh, about the populations they can provide important population data so for example fertility data <laughs> they can provide fertility data they can provide information about birth spacing most important they can provide uh, information around mortality um, uh, mortality statistics disaggregated by sex by gender and so on which are capturing not only the deaths that are happening at the facility level, but also the deaths, or they should capture also the deaths who are happening at community level, and something important in the actual conversation. But what is the challenge? Next slide, please. The challenge is that the majority of the deaths are invisible in official statistics from civil registration, and there are a lot of births which are invisible as well. So why is this happening at the global level? Next slide. I would say that this is happening because of a multitude of reasons, non-investments in these systems, as well as uh, you know, a poor uh, or little political will and um, non-interest and inability also of the global community to prove that investments in civil registration and vital statistic systems are cost effective as against inv investments in other uh, uh, data uh, data tools such as surveys for example um, as it stands we are uh, actually doing a lot of surveys instead of investing in these systems to be to have something more sustainable and, and real time and I, but one of the other things which is coming out is because of our inability as a, com as, a, as a community of practitioners to understand where the unregistered people are, why they are unregistered, and who they are. And it's only then when we are going to be able to support better the governments in how actually to improve the coverage rate, in particular for death registration. And why I'm saying in particular, if we look, next slide, if we look at the birth registration data around the world, and this is data pulled from the UN Statistics Division, you are going to see that many continents and many countries are faring pretty well. If we are to believe this data, some of whom it is pulled from civil registration and the National Institutes of Statistics compilation, but much of whom, for example, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for parts of Asia as well, it's pulled from surveys. The multi-indicator cluster survey is an indicator, uh, the DHS, and so on. 
uh, most recently the census. However, this, this um, um, map, very interesting as it might be here, it's not actually revealing the inequalities at country level and the disparities within the countries. And you were talking about how many children are not registered. Yes, the, there are 166 million, so one in four under five are not registered. But this is telling us only one side of the story, the side of the story from what the parents think they know. Actually, data from the multi-indicator cluster survey is telling us another story. 237 million children under five do not have a birth certificate, which, the situ which actually shows that the situation is much more complex. Now, when we go to death registration, what it is happening, and in between there is marriage, but there is not space for it. What is happening in death registration? Can you go to next slide, please? In this registration, the situation is dire. As you can see, most of Africa cannot produce vital statistics from CV registration, right? We have very uh, uh, little information from, from Asia with countries, for example, such as India and China, where you have big numbers of population lagging behind. Many of these countries are not at 80%, and many in Sub-Saharan Africa are under 5%, and they are not able to produce any statistics. So what this means, it means that practically only 50% of the deaths in the world are currently registered in CB registration, and most of deaths are in the development countries. In this developed country, the cause of death is also registered. In the low and middle income countries, this is mostly not being the case. There are two different processes in terms of the, the civil registration systems is not able to actually give us vital statistics with regards to the, to the causes of death. It's only able to give us absolute numbers disaggregated by sex, age, and geography, but not mortality causes. So we have 50% invisible in the causes of death. I think this is really tragical as, as, a, as a community. And in the context of the pandemic, this might have an impact in particular in these low and middle income countries. And why I'm saying so is that it's absolutely commendable the efforts that the governments and the stakeholders are doing during this pandemic in terms of compiling on a daily basis the mortality statistics. However, these mortality statistics are mostly compiled and coming from the health facilities. As the death registration in coming in, and we have seen this, for example, with UK and US most recently, the numbers are changing. They are starting to reflect also what it is happening at the community level. Now, if you switch a little bit to the map and you're looking at Africa and parts of Asia and Latin America, when many of these systems are not working and not capturing the causes, the causes of death and they are not capturing the death into the civil registration systems, the truth of the matter is that probably, perhaps, we will never know the real size of this epidemic in the low and middle income countries. There we are going to remain mostly in terms, in terms of, um, of estimates, as I would say. And this is going to be, it's a particular challenge because the governments are going to take informed decisions, but they're going to take decision based on some evidence, incomplete evidence. Whether this is going to be relevant or not, it's only the future who is going to be able to tell us. So what I'm going to try to advance here is that it's the data from CV registration system. So CV registration derived from, from uh, data, vital statistics derived from CV registration are the gold standard for vital statistics and, and, and deaths due, not only during the pandemic, but during normal time. Can you go to the next slide, please? The CV registration systems, uh, actually, they are able to, to capture the, the events, the most important live events through the life course, so from cradle to grave of the population, and it's able to provide us important statistical data for health and for good governance reasons. Next slide, please. So it remains actually to us. Next slide, please. It remains to us actually on see how this health system should collaborate in particular during the pandemic with the civil registration system so that they reflect the entire uh, mortality at the country level and, and um, 
and it's very difficult to do so in terms of the pandemic. And also, uh, us as a community of practitioners and the UN systems and other and other stakeholders to support low and middle income countries to actually try to fill to the extent possible the data gap during the pandemic. And I'm going to end with a number here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is 75,000. And by the end of this 24 hours marathon, 75,000 deaths will remain unregistered within the civil registration systems across the world. So this is giving you a little bit of a view of where we are and uh, with the civil registration system. Thank you very much. Thanks, Irina. That was fabulous. A really good overview, if, if rather harrowing, I would say. Um, to have uh, a sense that so many people out there are going through, you know, either births, uh, major, major traumatic events, or they're losing loved ones, and that information is not being recorded, and we're not able to respond appropriately. Um, Andy, so um, Arena's painted a, a pretty bleak picture. Are there opportunities for innovation that might help us monitor health and well-being more effectively, and perhaps even give us some tools to be able to track COVID? Um, over to sure. you to give us a bit more optimism. <laughs> thanks. thanks, Jess, and thanks, Karina. Yeah, I have a, a few slides as well that, that although don't solve the problem, we would ideally like everywhere in the world to have this CRVS data. There are possibilities, and this is the, the work of our group at Southampton and WorldPop, is to try and utilise geospatial data to, to try and fill in some of these gaps. So. Um, we, yeah, we work to integrate different types of data to try and fill these gaps where they exist. Ideally, we do have, we, we want CRVS data, but if they're not, in, not existing, then there's possibilities. And so if we go to the next slide, what we, what we work towards is um, it's a small area demographic data, and that, that has multiple uses. You see here, I've, I've flagged on the right hand side there those that relate to health the health system planning supply chain management health metrics and very relevant at the moment controlling infectious diseases uh, and modeling the spread and intervention effects so we go to the next slide um, what we do is try and uh, firstly get that basic denominator how many people there are then how many people are in the different demographic groups of interest and so that could be the elderly in, in the case of, of covid um, their access and use and quality of healthcare. So can we actually reach those people? Can they reach health services? And then are the people actually utilizing those, those health services? So if we go to the next slide, um, what we've heard about and what is a continual problem, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, other low and middle income countries is the data is either coarse resolution, it can be outdated, it can be incomplete, or it can just be completely missing. So if we go to the next slide, um, the kind of data that isn't missing or incomplete are, are things that we can start to gather together from, from correlates, from things that relate to population distributions and their characteristics. So we try and build up a picture of the landscape. If you go to the, the next uh, animation here. Um, so we, we have data from satellites mapping individual building locations so we know where people are and where they're not. Um, we have data from household surveys to look at uh, poverty rates, neighborhood sizes, um, roads, schools, markets, all relate to how populations distribute themselves and some relation to their characteristics. So we go to the next slide, I can demonstrate if we have data here that may be a sample of, of census data and it's data that's coarse resolution. We know maybe in one of these units there's uh, 20,000 people, we don't really know where they are to be able to direct services to them, to be able to identify and target interventions. So if we go to the next slide, what we do have is data at much more detailed resolution, the mapping of buildings from satellites. On the next slide, we have the mapping of the, the Earth at night from satellites to identify where, where is there actually economic activity, where there, there are people um, doing things. We, so if we go to the next slide, we can go from this coarse resolution picture, and then on the next slide, uh, we can use statistical modeling approaches to move those people uh, and give a much more consistent and detailed picture. On the next slide, that gives us the, the population distributions. Um, and this is something that's available now across the world, um, estimates of those distributions. Um, on the next slide, we have uh, the, the kind of detail that's available. And also on the next slide, uh, the 
the demographic characteristics and how those change across time when we're integrating together survey, uh, census, census microdata to give us that picture. So on the next slide, um, we can bring together also household survey data, as Irina mentioned. There are, there are multiple of these household surveys in the places where CRVS does not exist to give us things like age-specific fertility data, to pick out those subnational patterns uh, and use those to adjust our, our population maps to identify distributions of births and pregnancies. And of course, these are, these are estimates with high levels of uncertainty, but they are giving us uh, data to start at the basis of, of some estimates. If we go to the next slide, um, and these again, these data are openly available um, with uncertainty around them, but gridded estimates of pregnancies and births. And on the next slide, we can then start to integrate these types of data with uh, the mapping of hospitals, health centers, clinics, and identifying how far are they away from uh, where those people are. Um, how easy is it to get to them by integrating them with road network data? So on the next slide, we can start to highlight where are those areas that where, where women who are, are pregnant have a, have a challenge in physically reaching um, a healthcare. And on the next slide, um, we can also start to if we go through, click through this slide, we can identify that the physical access, but also then integrate it with the, the location of household surveys that give us information on how health services are being utilized. And on the next slide, uh, build a, a multi-level model that takes into account both the characteristics of the population, their ease of accessing health services, uh, and the, the geographical characteristics. So that finally, on the next slide, we can identify at smaller areas um, where those, those hotspots of poor health service utilization is, in this case, skilled birth attendants, antenatal care, and postnatal care with the, the East African community. So I'll stop there, but that hopefully gives some indication of, of trying to fill some of those gaps that, that exist for the, the, the lack of CRVS data. Um, but obviously, ideally, we would focus on improving those systems so that we can actually get the, the data rather than our estimates from, from modeling from household surveys. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. That's brilliant. And, and really um, exciting and interesting to see how many different kind of new innovative approaches are, are emerging. Um, We'll, we'll dig into this in a bit more detail in a minute, but Andy, one of the things that, you know, a lot of what you've said seems uh, very feasible, right? Is then obviously you need uh, statistical, you know, good modelers and you need to have access to this data, but why aren't these approaches more commonplace already? You know, why aren't more country governments doing this kind of thing? Um, I think it, it actually, it actually the, the growth of geographic information systems and spatial data has been huge over the last 10 years and um, we are seeing quite a, a, a wealth of skills in these countries um, but it takes it does take time to filter through to very busy statistics offices very overworked ministries of health um, and so that's something that has, has always takes time for these kind of innovations to to get through um, but as I've shown in the, the East African community, um, we've worked closely with them for, for the last couple of years. And there's there's a lot of skilled people who are starting to utilize these kinds of data and approaches. So I think there's a there's a lot of promise out there, but it, it again it takes it does take time and it needs it needs people to have time away from very busy schedules. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things you've said is it's obviously it takes time because of capacity development and training. Right. A lot of this is using GIS data or developing models, which might be approaches that statistician, statisticians sitting in within national statistical offices or other ministries might not necessarily have skills of, you know, with thus, you know, at the moment. So, Irina, um, a question I had for you is. Is, is a lot of the, the sort of pro lack of progress we're seeing on CLVS systems because of that? the lack of skills uh, or is it much more about money or what are the sort of major barriers to investments in in something as fundamental as a as a civil registration system i wouldn't say so i wouldn't say it's only lack of skills you know i think that the um, lack of progress it's probably due to multiple reasons and it has to be assessed at per country, you know, I mean, when and this is why there are a lot of tools and methodologies to actually assess the civil registration systems into the country and, and why are the reasons of non-progress. 
Some, for example, are related to the fact that civil registration and vital statistics systems have not been a priority of governments and an area of investment over the last 60 years, and we are seeing gradual investment into the system only from 2013, 2014 onwards. Before that, from the from late 90s, beginning of the year 2000, um, progress has been uneven. So there has been a lot of progress in birth registration, but nothing in, in death registration and nothing in marriage registration. At this point, for example, we don't know anything about um, marriage registration. We don't know how many marriages are registered all over the world, for example, because of, of, of this reason. So, because of lack of investments and lack of prioritization for the entire system, this has resulted into low-skilled, for instance, staff. It has re resulted into allocation of resources on paper, but not releasing the funds in reality to the, to the uh, civil registration services, for example. So, Consequently, there is no uh, in, uh, digitization of the system, there is no investment into, you know, innovations, everything which is happening, it's uh, happening mostly in pilots and so on. And I'm afraid to say that albeit progress on, on birth registration has been good, we are uh, assisting, and for those who are health experts, uh, maybe they, you know, correct me if I am wrong, to something similar to what we have uh, assisted into polio eradication, you know, there have been huge investments in polio eradication, which has been detrimental to the Im routine immunization per se. So I, I'd say these are some of the reasons. And another reason which I would say is that we never spend time with the communities to actually understand why there is no demand for these services. For example, recent results who are coming in from different countries is showing us that People are interested only in birth registration. They see no reason why they should register the death. You know, they have there are community practices and there are customs which are preventing them from going towards the services. So I think it's a multitude of factors and so, but I think that low and middle income countries have the youth who have capacity and have the, the interest and the, the fact that they are innovating in so many domains. It is actually a ray of hope because I think that there is possibility to innovate also at scale in CRVI system, provided, of course, that uh, uh, substantial resources are available to, to be invested into these systems. Thanks, Irina. So um, you just referred to the polio uh, problem, the fact that investments in polio in the polio campaign have sort of removed attention away from core statistical strengthening, I mean, core strengthening of the health services around generalised vaccination campaigns. Is that a bit of a risk during COVID? Do you think during COVID um, we're seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of excitement around new ways of monitoring this particular epidemic, which risks taking money away from general system strengthening both for the health sector but also for CRVS. I wouldn't like to adventure myself in making, making these uh, kind of predictions because I don't have really a globe on that. I think, however, that in terms of the current pandemic, uh, this is showing us the weaknesses of our systems, not only yeah. in low and middle income countries, but across the world, you know, and, and it has taken the entire world by surprise. So that's why there have, you know, there are revisions constantly also with regards to mortality statistics and so on. And if we are looking back, for example, uh, at the statistics from January and February in UK and, and in US, most recently the, 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 the statisticians general offices have said that as comparative data from 2019 and 2018 showed that there was significant increase of pneumonia-like ca causes of death, you know, in, but nobody actually has spent enough time in analyzing those data. So actually it's not showing us a failure. What I think it shows us it is a way to actually work better and that hopefully this pandemic it's going to, you know, uh, show us that we need integrated systems, we need sustainable in, in, uh, investments in reliable data systems and we need statisticians and demographers who are able to actually help us analyze this data, interpret it and help the decision maker take informed decision. So I'd say more it's like an opportunity. I don't think that there will be, uh, I think that there will be of course restraint uh, and, and the significant pressure on resources. Um, 
as economies are shrinking ac across the world, but I think that uh, the importance of data is coming more and more preeminent in the today's world. Thank you. Well, that's great, Irina. And I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, hopefully this is going to really push or turn the tide towards a much more real time evidence based decision making sure. process. And um, particularly given the fact that we can now have, you know, daily satellite information, we can now have uh, real time data on a huge number of variables. So there's no reason why policy and decision makers shouldn't be able to use that sort of suite of information or dashboards of information as they make uh, investment decisions. Um, Andy, um, uh, a lot of the, the methods that you were talking about and you were showing lots of maps are derived from satellite imagery, right? So using um, aerial images of, of a given land area to estimate you know, infrastructure and then from that population and so on. Are there any risks to be, to be using this kind of satellite observation, aerial observation, uh, particularly with quite high resolution uh, more often and more frequently? Um, and particularly, you know, if that's all in the hands of government, um, are there any particular risks to having high resolution daily satellite imagery uh, within national government? Um, yes, I mean, firstly, I think that the satellite data is is one component, but the most the most important component of all of that that I showed is household survey data, it's census data, and it's ideally CRVS data. And the, the satellite data is really then we're looking at correlations, we're looking at things that can help us fill in those gaps where there hasn't been any data collection. Um, so that's that's one component. And and the fact that these, these really detailed satellite images, um, there is there's moves, there's certainly moves towards getting daily really detailed satellite imagery, but we're certainly, we're not there yet. Most of the images we're using are ones that are a collection of images taken across the course of months or years. Um, there's still, we're, bat we're still we're battling against cloud cover. Um, uh, we're battling against just satellites not being pointed in the right direction to collect data. So although it seems like we're getting to a point with daily detailed satellite imagery, we're, we're really not there yet. Uh, and uh, yes, there is of course a risk of um, we can now identify, we can map out individual buildings across an entire country. Um, that's 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 been the case in in the UK, in the US, across most of the world for a long time with Google Google data, Google Maps. Um, I think the the benefits out certainly outweigh the disadvantages of actually people being being on the map, and people can then we can then intervene and know that those people are there and provide vaccination services. For, for decades, there's been large areas just not on the map at all, and neglected by government policy, neglected by aid agencies, because they just weren't there. So I, I think the benefits significantly outweigh the disadvantages. Thanks, Andy. And there was a very good point put in the question box, which is that, of course, sometimes um, areas or people are not recorded in censuses and other social surveys because they don't want to be, um, because they don't want to be surveilled or counted by the population, I mean, by the government for political reasons. And I think that's a good point and does, obviously, in the context of more aerial imagery and so on, that does raise questions about uh, the implications for political systems and governance. Um, anyway, a very good point. Thanks, Andy. Um, there was also another question from a gentleman um, called Samhadi Khan, who I believe was probably in our previous session being run by our colleagues in Afghanistan, asking about um, the, how we can monitor these issues in, in places like Afghanistan. And Andy, I know you've done quite a lot of work in um, low-income countries and particularly in Afghanistan. You know, can you just tell us a little bit about why your approach has been really um, uh, basically helpful essentially in Afghanistan in, in being able to get a more robust handle on how many people there are, how many people you need to serve, um, how to build health facilities and so on. Um, yeah, so our work with Afghanistan started through a collaboration with UNFPA. Um, the last census in, in Afghanistan was in 1979 and all decisions, all allocation of resources, all aid agencies are using projections from a 1979 baseline which are which the government uh, just takes a 2.2% linear growth rate. So huge uncertainties, particularly at subnational scales on the number of people. So we worked with um, UNFPA, with the, with the government. This was a re request that came from President Ghani um, to firstly map out where all the settlements were and then work with the government and, and survey teams to get um, more recent collection of population data 
uh, and use that in, uh, again, in statistical models of the kind that I've shown to estimate population numbers across the country and then cross-validate with, with, the, with the different surveys that were going on. Uh, and it's suggested that we're producing more accurate numbers and those, those numbers have since been used for um, planning household surveys for the vaccination efforts. Um, so it's again, there's there's big uncertainties, but it's it's a step forward. We think from a 1979 projection. Absolutely, thanks, Andy. I think that's been hugely uh, exciting and, and crucial work um, for the government as they try to plan for the you know further development of infrastructure and essential services. Um, Arena, I want to come back to you and and just ask you know with all this innovation and particularly in the context of COVID, we're seeing a lot of. Uh, you know, telecommunications companies coming forward and big data companies coming forward and everyone offering a new solution to try and monitor the, the crisis. Do you worry that all of this um, innovation, all of this hype about innovation is going to detract attention and investment away from building core systems like CLVS? Um, no, actually, on the contrary, I believe that the fact that there are, you know, the, the, the private sector is coming in, maybe this is really a call for the private sector to invest more in these CV registration and vital statistics systems. In some of the places, I believe that this restraint of the private, private sector to invest in it, it's also due to the reluctance of the governments to collaborate with the private sector on these uh, systems, which, you know, they deal with the, with the data of the citizens, there are a lot of discussions around data protection, you know, um, not only in Europe, across the world, this is coming to be to become more and more important. But what it is, what this is showing us, it is that uh, it would be good to actually leverage the know how and the power and the resources of the private sector, in particular of the big data companies, you know, big telecommunication companies and so on, to strengthen the civil registration system and make that sustainable and reliable over time you know but let's again what I'm saying it's good to have the data but to have the data you really need the people to go to the services so into this equation let us not forget not only the governments and the state let us not forget that the most also an important <laughs> part of it is my web camera Excuse me, I think you're in another webinar. I think that an important part of the equation it is how do we bring the population to the services? How can we leverage the power of knowledge of the communities around all these vital events and make what they know into civil registration records, which then translates into data. I think that this is really a vital part of the conversation. I mean, we are talking about high tech and you can have a most high tech system with the most data on phones and iPads and whatsoever. If people don't go to the services, if they don't use the services, you're going to be exactly in the same place and you're going to do these nice surveys and estimates and wonderful things which Andy is doing, but you're still not going to have your reliable system. So I think the next step is also bring the population to the system and the system to the population, make it mobile, you know, make it flexible to the population while keeping data protection and privacy rules so that you have a system which is collaborating so the demand side and the supply side are collaborating to produce one's protection for the entire population through the la life life course and second reliable which is translated then in vital statistics uh, from civil registration with important parts as i said around fertility whatever mortality morbidity whatever it is Thanks, Irina. Um, really good uh, comments and points that, you know, it's ultimately about demand and uptake and we need to focus a lot on trying to encourage more people to use these systems, to seek them out, to demand um, these kinds of uh, these kinds of systems. One other thing, a question I was thinking about as we were talking about the private sector getting more involved and innovation and so on. In the context of, of building CRVS systems, some countries are moving towards digital ID programs instead. I'm thinking, for example, about India, which of course has a very famous um, digital ID system. Um, we won't go into the specifics of that necessarily, but what I'm interested to know is, do you think that in the future, 
you know, we're going to move towards a digital ID system, which will be linked to the health system. So governments have information about births, deaths, all major events, but also sort of, you know, a major health status event all in one place. I mean, do you think that's kind of the way technology is evolving and ways that private companies might potentially be getting more involved? I think that the technology and the systems are already evolving in many parts of the world in this direction, you know, and the, the health system, it is an incre incredibly integrant part and supportive part of these identity management information systems, if you want it larger, which contain you know, not only digital identity, but ID cards, CV registration, and so on and so forth, because health produces the notification. It's also a way to monitor, actually, if everything which is happening at the health level, it's reflected into a CV registration and vital statistic systems. If it would be, at least that mortality statistics and the death statistics would be reflected into the CV registration systems. This is not the case for the moment. But we are seeing progress into that, into that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, direction, into the sense that uh, many countries, these are the recommendations of the UN uh, Statistics Division, many countries are working on integrating systems, on making, you know, um, alignment between health and CV registration and vital statistics systems. We are seeing this a lot with the raising of the global financing facility, which is tying investments also in reproductive maternal neonatal uh, health with severe advancements in CV registration and vital statistics system strengthening. So there is a lot of progress around that. There are cases which we have been monitoring around it, and, and I think that yes, this is going, this is what the future looks like. Thanks, Irina. Interesting, exciting to think about that. Um, Although it raises lots of questions too. Um, a couple of questions that have come up uh, from the audience. I mean, one question that was raised, uh, which really strikes at the heart of everything we've been discussing, is why don't you rely on national data agencies for COVID data? It came from Reka. Um, and I think, Reka, we've been kind of getting to the crux of that through all of our presentations, which is that, you know, where possible we should, but very, very often they don't have the population data, the civil registration data that you need in order to really understand the extent of the epidemic. But Andy, um, turning to you, I mean, you've been doing some work specifically on helping to track COVID. What's the kind of data that you're producing for national governments? How are you kind of complementing what they're collecting themselves? Um, so we are trying to build um, statistical models to try and help guide uh, broad decisions about Firstly, which types of interventions work where and when, um, and then um, exit strategies as well. So we can't all remain locked down forever. It's thinking about um, what, what happens next. Uh, and that involves integrating together broad spatial data on, on the, the populations, um, their characteristics. So where are the, where are the uh, men over 80, the really high risk groups, um, where the, there's there's populations who are who are much higher risk than others. Are there are there hotspots of those? Are there, is it different by different country? Which is certainly the case. We've seen excess mortality in Italy that that's related substantially to the fact that they're the second eldest population in the world. Uh, and then we're looking at broadly the flows between those different regions through, through things like mobile data, aggregating those together to understand how are they connected. Um, and that, although it's, again, very uncertain data, it does give a guidance on how the disease might spread, what happens if you release uh, interventions in one place, what effect will it have on other places. So it's, um, those are the, the kind of data that we're, we're assembling together and um, sharing insights with those response agencies to to guide their decision making. Great, thanks Andy. Um, uh, another question that's coming from the audience before I um, ask some final questions of you both. Um, uh, what do you think of the initiatives that Eurostat, the European statistical um, entity, has instigated to collect weekly data on deaths around uh, EU countries? Is that something that's being used in the context of monitoring COVID-19? Or do you have any other reflections on kind of Eurostat's um, efforts to try and improve the quality of death statistics um, across Europe. Uh, Arena, pass that one to you first. 
I think that this is really a commendable effort of a Euro stance. It would be very good to have the at least data from a big block of countries who are in the, you know, in uh, members of Eurostat. So this is really, really commendable. It will also show us trends and possibilities to make the comparisons where comparisons are possible against, you know, among countries and within the countries to look at different disparities and the data which uh, which uh, Andy was uh, was just mentioning. Thank you. And I have to um, apologize that I have accidentally deleted one of the questions that came up in the <laughs> question box. So I have to ask whoever just submitted that final question, if you could please add it back in, that would be much appreciated and we'll make sure we'll get to it. So apologies for that. Um, okay, I just, a couple of other questions for you both. Um, Andy, a, a general reflection. Um, do you think that during a crisis, this is kind of a, a good time or a very risky time to be innovating? I mean, um, a lot of people say that the crisis, a crisis is the last time you should be trying innovative approaches because of concerns about governance and so on. What do you think? Uh, it's, I mean, it's certainly driven a huge amount of innovation. There's a vast number of academic papers and new things that are being put forward. Um, it, it's there's a need for there's a need for coming up with solutions fast for something like this um on the other side of things uh, the bar of quality has has dropped a bit necessarily the, the kind of uh, valid the kind of test statistical tests we would do the kind of rigorous checking of data that we would normally do um just as a necessity for getting the supporting decision makers has to has to re be reduced a bit uh, and it's up to the scientific community generally to to now self almost like self police itself to point out something that where where corners have been cut too much and the the kind of innovation is is pushing the data too far or giving false insights or poor guidance so yeah there's it's uh there's a, a double edged sword there i think it's and it's certainly yeah. driving some great innovation that i think will will last but also some innovation that is is not as high quality as as it could be. And Andy, I mean, you referred to the scientific community, but personally, I'd also say that this is a a, a big area that citizens need to to be attentive to and hold their governments to account on. I mean, for example, we've seen some countries in Latin America. One in particular has recently reneged on their Freedom of Information Act on the grounds that they need to be able to move quickly and innovate quickly and use data as they so choose. But I would argue that you should never be able to renege on your Freedom of Information Act and actually making sure that those methods are fully transparent. It's hugely important for after COVID and as we come out of this crisis, making sure we have ethical um, data management systems. Um, so, yeah, great. Arena, um, a, a final question for both of you, actually, but I'll start with you, Arena. Um, for countries that have really limited resources, that are really struggling in general, but also in the context of COVID, where do you think they should invest right now to have the greatest impact? You know, what are one or other aspect of the statistical system do you think could really help countries make sure that they are kind of as equipped as possible um, to respond and monitor this crisis? I think it would be around, uh, you know, quickly, fairly quickly speeding up the process of capacity strengthening, in particular around, you know, estimates of the coverage and completeness of registration of vital events. I think that this would be really one. Another one, it would be massive public information and awareness raising campaigns to just make the population coming through the uh, uh, towers, the systems and, and integrated investments in health inf monitoring information systems linked with CRVS and larger identity management systems. That I think is, should be really the priority. With, of course, uh, uh, legislation which are uh, respecting uh, data and enforcing data protection and privacy for the citizens. Great, thanks, Arena. And Andy, same question to you. If there's one area for, for focused and attention and investment right now, what do you think it should be? Uh, I, yeah, I agree with Irina. I think this, this integrated health system uh, capacity strengthening is important. Um, although we, we, we expect coronavirus to cause uh, major excess death, we shouldn't, and, and the, in the course of addressing that, neglect the rest of the health system and the fact that there will be continually deaths from malaria. There will be disruptions to vaccination programs that could ultimately outweigh the deaths that we see from, from COVID. And, and until we have some integrated 
assessments and, and keep that data collection, we actually won't know and we won't be able to guide how we balance up those, those systems to make sure those, those issues are continuing to, being, to be addressed and that the right resources are put in the right place. Absolutely, absolutely. So we can't, of course, lose sight of some of those, you know, huge uh, repetitive causes of, of death and morbidity and so on, and, and make sure that we're strengthening the whole system to be able to respond to that as well. So uh, it just remains for me to thank our amazing speakers, Arena and Andy, for their great inputs. Um, and also thank you to the organisers of this, my colleagues at SDSN. Um, one of the things I love about this 24-hour webinar is that, you know, you can be talking about health systems sudden, and suddenly the former Prime Minister of Greece just pops in and then disappears again. <laughs> so, um, lovely to, to have so many interesting and high-level people on the line. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I'll